Bubblegum Crisis is a series with historic significance to both the Japanese and Western anime fandom. For Japan, it was one of the major titles released during the OVA boom of the mid-1980s. Overseas, it was one of the earliest titles brought over and given an English dub that accurately reflected the Japanese script. And unlike other titles available at that time, the barrier of entry was way lower for viewers less familiar with anime and Japanese culture, as the series was heavily influenced by Western films and music videos. The majority of the cast even have Western names, which made it way more easier to follow for newcomers. What's most interesting about Bubblegum Crisis' initial success, though, is that many of its themes and concepts actually spawned from previous failed anime produced by its creator, Toshimichi Suzuki. I say initial success because throughout its production history, the series was plagued with budget and legal issues, eventually leading to the series' premature cancellation. The legal issues wouldn't end with the series' cancellation, though, as the fallout would send Suzuki on a downward spiral, eventually involving the Yakuza and his own personal exile, with his ultimate fate unknown to the public for almost 20 years. Artmic was a design studio founded in 1978 by former Tatsunoko producer Toshimichi Suzuki. Artmic wasn't a traditional animation studio though, as they focused on story and design work, outsourcing the actual animation to other companies, usually AIC. This was similar to Studio Nue, who at the time were most known for their work on Space Battleship Yamato. Artmic's first project was called Technopolis 21C, and was about a cop in the future assigned to a special task force that would use robot assistance to give them an edge on the criminals. The staff consisted of industry veterans, due to Suzuki's connections from Tatsunoko, including names like Yoshitaka Amano and future Ghibli composer Joe Hisaishi. The theme was performed by Mokoto Fujiwara, best known for and for the mech design, Suzuki would get Studio Nui's own Shoji Kawamori and Kazutaka Miyatake, also best known for Despite the all-star team behind the scenes, the project fell through, with only scattered bits of animation done for the first few episodes. Suzuki decided that the best he could do to try to recoup his loss was by releasing the animation that was already completed as a film. The film was released by Toho Eizo and dubbed in English in Hong Kong, using the same voice actors they would use to dub Godzilla movies. You are in no position to handle this tank, so I've called in the fighters. They'll be here within the hour. What's that? Have you gone mad? We can't do that. We can't have a war here. Technopolis flopped in theaters and received predominantly negative reception, but the concept remained in Suzuki's mind as one that he felt he could revisit once he had the proper resources. Not long after the failure of Technopolis in late 1982, Artmix Shinji Aramaki and Hideki Kagenuma began pitching a concept they'd developed that was similar to Technopolis. The series was titled AD Patrol, and it was set in a futuristic city where cops chased criminals using advanced motorcycles that could transform into their robot partners. At the time, the anime Macross was in the middle of its initial TV run, and the series was pulling in great ratings. As a result, Macross sponsor Takutoku told Aramaki and Kakenuma that they should change their premise, making it about a war between humans and aliens. This was because Takutoku was looking for an anime to take over Macross's time slot after the series completed, and for a moment it seemed like Aramaki and Kakenuma had what they were looking for. They adjusted their premise to be about humans having to reclaim Earth from alien invaders. Kakenuma said his initial idea was for a sci-fi version of the 1962 film The Longest Day, with soldiers dropping onto the planet and charging the alien base using transforming motorcycles, similar to the storming of the beaches of Normandy. Due to the popularity of the character Minmei, they were also told that the anime needed to have a singer, leading to the creation of a character known at the time as Nora. Since Minmei embodied the wholesome girl next door archetype seen in most idols of the time, it was decided that Nora would be based off idol Akina Nakamori. Nakamori was relatively new to the idol scene, but made waves due to her rebellious attitude, provocative lyrics, and distinct powerhouse voice. She was also considered the rival to Seiko Matsuda, who was the idol that originally inspired Minmei. Nora was a rebel, a rock singer, and a former biker. However, everything changed when scenario writer Sukehiro Tomita saw Yoshitaka Amano's design for the character Yellow Belmont. When Tomita saw the design, he said, that's our singer. Originally, Yellow Belmont was a former soldier, but at Tomita's request was given dual identities, one of a man who used to be a soldier, and the other of a female singer, and the character would alternate between a male and female voice actor depending on which identity was assumed. The character Nora was reversioned into the character Huke at Rose, and though she's still a loner and a former member of a biker gang, 
her role as the musician was revoked. Despite this, her finalized character sheet actually still lists her hobbies as musical performance, but this is simply an oversight. According to Aramaki, Takatoku said the motorcycle idea was too weak to be its own show, suggesting more changes to make the show similar to Macross, the biggest being the assistance of a fighter jet that could transform into a mech, leading to the creation of the Legios. The series would be titled Genesis Climber Mospita, Mospita being the name of the transforming motorcycle. However, the Legios would be pushed to the forefront at the behest of the advertisers, to the point that, by only a few episodes into the show, the titular mech had become obsolete. It's unclear why Takatoku passed on Mospita, choosing Orgus as the successor of Macross, but when asked, Shinji Aramaki said it was due to political reasons. Mospita would have fallen into the same pitfall as Technopolis, if not for plastic model company Gaken, who heard of the proposal and arranged a meeting where they agreed to sponsor the show. Though not to the degree of Technopolis, Mospita flopped hard, but Artbrick would soon discover a new avenue for their talent, an avenue that they themselves would pioneer. History repeated itself in the worst way during the production of Omega City 2-3, eventually renamed Megazone 2-3. The series suffered from budgeting issues after the plastic model company lined up to produce the kits for the series backed out of their arrangement. As a result, the animation done for the series was combined to create a standalone anime film. The film had a short theatrical run before its release on VHS, and despite plot holes and an incomplete ending, audiences loved it. And Megazone is often credited as opening the floodgates for the OVA boom of the 80s. And it was during this anime boom that Artmic would shine. In December of 1985, at the rap party for Fightixer 1, Suzuki met Junji Fujita, the founder of Yomex. Yomex was a subsidiary of Toshiba EMI, who were looking to invest in the growing straight-to-video anime market. Fujita asked for a pitch, and Suzuki gave him the skeleton of his Technopolis remake. After some brainstorming with Fujita, the concept began to shift. In 1984, the film Streets of Fire flopped in the US, but in Japan it was a hit, becoming a cultural touchstone. Suzuki initially considered changing the story to a sci-fi retelling of Streets of Fire, which would allow them to recycle their concept for the female rock singer, as well as utilize Yomex's connections in the record industry. However, two other films released between 1982 and 1985 would also influence the makeup of this project. Those would be 1982's Blade Runner and 1984's Terminator. Suzuki's original concept focused on the AD police, the special police force in the Bubblegum Crisis universe who investigate boomer crimes, boomers being the name for advanced androids. Though originally influenced by Techno Police and the premise for AD Patrol, the AD Police in the finished version appear more like Blade Runners. The AD Police wouldn't hold the spotlight for long, as Suzuki decided he wanted the heroes to be mercenaries, soldiers for hire who'd wear hard suits to fight against boomers when political reasons prevented the AD Police from doing so. This aspect was inspired by the Jidai Geki drama Hisatsu Shiokinyan, which was about merchants in the Edo period who'd moonlight as assassins. Hence why the Night Saber's leader, Celia Stingray, is shown operating a lingerie store in the first episode. For the designs of the hard suits, Suzuki showed character designer Kenichi Sonoda the music video for the song Go by the band Asia. Sonoda noted that the woman in the music video was wearing a form-fitting suit, but thought it would look more futuristic if she was wearing full body armor. When it came to developing the individual characters, Suzuki wanted an all-female cast due to the profitable returns seen on the release of Ixer 1 and Gall Force, which were both female-driven OVAs. Fujita's involvement led to Suzuki having access to professional music talent, and so the main character would be a female singer, with Suzuki almost completely recycling the Nora character. Pris, named for the Blade Runner character, was a former biker and rock singer who preferred to do things her own way. She even had a similar backstory to Huke. Huke left her biker gang after her boyfriend abandoned her during a fight with a rival gang, whereas Pris was a biker whose boyfriend was killed by a boomer, a crime which was never brought to justice due to the corruption caused by Genom. Pris's voice was provided by J-Rock singer Kinuko Omori, who had no acting experience and stood out for her deep voice among the other female voice actors. The first installment of Bubblegum Crisis, Tinsel City, dropped on February 25th, 1987. The video was a hit. In response, two more OVAs continuing the story were released in September and December of that year, albeit with shorter runtimes due to budget constraints. At the time of Bubblegum Crisis's release, an OVA on VHS cost roughly 10,000 yen, or about 91 US dollars. Because Bubblegum Crisis was a series, requiring potential buyers to commit to buying multiple episodes, the price was reduced to 68,000 yen, or about 60 USD. This meant the series was on a tight budget though, 
In an An America interview, Suzuki said it was a necessary sacrifice, and as a result, the team had to choose what information would make it into animation, and what would have to be explained in supplemental material, like novels and drama CDs. As a result, character backgrounds are mostly absent from the series, with one of the few exceptions being Celia Stingray, who has a vague flashback suggesting Genom's Vice President Brian Mason murdered her father. Lina and Pris's backstories are nowhere to be seen in the series, though we see flashes of them in the music video for Asue Touch down, which was included at the end of the third videotape. Following the release of the third episode, a major issue arose that threatened the longevity of the series. In 1988, Omori signed a new recording contract with Sony Records, and a stipulation of that contract prevented her from singing on the Bubblegum Crisis soundtrack. This caused tension behind the scenes, as the entire point of hiring Omori was so Pris could sing her own songs. And so it was decided that Pris would be killed, only to be replaced with a new character named Vision. Vision was also a singer, and would be the sister of Lina's friend Irene, who was killed in episode too. However, when fans heard of the plan to kill Pris, there was an outrage, and many said they would abandon the series if Omori left the project. Omori was kept on the project and Yomex continued to release songs, only they were now credited as Pris and the Nightsabers and contained ensemble vocals to avoid legal issues. The consistency of its music was important because Bubblegum Crisis was unparalleled in terms of both its quantity and quality of music. Yomex made sure each OVA contained an album's worth of songs, many of which contained vocal tracks, which made them more desirable than your average anime OST. It's worth mentioning though that many of these songs have similarities to pre-existing pop songs, with some being clearly inspired, and others being outright plagiarized. Episode 3, the final episode released in 1987, saw the Nightsabers defeat Brian Mason, but due to the popularity of the series, they were able to continue, with Suzuki stating he planned for 13 episodes overall. Episodes 4 through 6 would see the rise of a new villain, Largo, a boomer seeking revenge on both the Nightsabers and the Genom Corporation, inspired by Blade Runner's Roy Batty. Largo would be defeated in Episode 6, which released in August of 1989. The next episode was Double Vision, released in March of 1990, and recycled the planned Vision story minus the death of Pris. But as the 90s began, Japan's bubble economy was ending, and anime sales across the country were dropping. Despite having six more episodes planned, the eighth episode of Bubblegum Crisis would be its last, and it seemed like Artmic and AIC weren't ready to come to terms with that, since the episode is essentially a filler episode filled with slice of life gags and no sense of finality. Following episode 8, Yomex and Artmic parted ways. However, Artmic continued the Bubblegum Crisis story with animation company AIC, and in May of 1991, they released the first episode of Bubblegum Crash, a new OVA series intended to complete the story of the original Bubblegum Crisis. Crash was a direct sequel to Crisis, though several plot details are omitted, possibly due to rights issues since Yomex wasn't involved anymore. The production of Crash is very sketchy, as character designer Kenichi Sonoda said he had left Artmic prior to production of the first episode. The voice cast would return with the exception of Amori, who following the end of Crisis wanted to focus more on her music career, as her band Silk was way more popular now than when she was originally cast as Pris. Without Yomex, the music suffered, and Crash would ultimately have a generic soundtrack, lacking any of the excitement of the Crisis soundtrack. Even the stolen music in Crash isn't as good. Crash 
Crash would meet a similar demise, only this time it was due to direct legal issues from Yomex, who claimed partial ownership over the Bubblegum Crisis IP. Yomex came at Artmic with a lawsuit that put the series in limbo until 1997. It's believed that Crash was supposed to run for 5 or 6 episodes, but only ran for 3. By then, Artmic had defaulted on their debt, and declared bankruptcy. All their assets were liquidated, and many of the properties, including Bubblegum Crisis, were purchased by AIC. A year later, in 1998, the debt they had acquired from Artmic led to Yomex being absorbed back into Toshiba EMI. Toshimichi Suzuki had disappeared, along with many of Artmic's assets, including original art pieces by Kenichi Sonoda. After legally acquiring the rights to Bubblegum Crisis, along with several other Artmic properties, AIC entered production on a Bubblegum Crisis TV series that retold the events of the OVA. It was around this time that Suzuki re-emerged, this time at AIC's office and alongside several Yakuza. Suzuki claimed AIC owed him royalties over Bubblegum Crisis 2040. AIC said they didn't owe him anything, and when he tried to intimidate them with Yakuza, AIC just called the cops and had the Yakuza arrested. Suzuki escaped this altercation, but went into hiding, disappearing from the public eye for 20 years. Speculation ranged from him fleeing the country to him being killed by other Yakuza due to his real estate deaths. It was only in September of 2020 that we'd get an update from Suzuki's son himself. Suzuki's son had discovered the speculation over his father's whereabouts and created a Twitter account for the sole purpose of updating the world on his father. Following the altercation with AIC, Suzuki went into hiding, living in complete seclusion out of shame, both because of his extensive debt as well as his criminal actions. He survived by working as a painter. His son even found a photo of a painting on Suzuki's cell phone, which he believed his father had done for a client. These updates came at the bitter expense of learning that Suzuki had died earlier that year, in late January of 2020. In 2018, character designer Kenichi Sonoda launched a Kickstarter to create a new OVA based on his manga, Gunsmith Cats. The Kickstarter was successful, and when asked if he'd ever considered working on a Bubblegum Crisis revival, Sonoda stated, I was merely the character and mechanical designer, with no rights assigned to me per se, but if I'm asked to work on Bubblegum Crisis again, I'd love to take it on. For those people watching for the first time, I would love to recommend parts 1 through 8, but you don't need to watch Bubblegum Crash. 